Commentary of St. Augustine on Psalm 7, Part 4 God, the righteous judge, strong in endurance and long-suffering, verse 11. What God is judge but the Lord who judges the people? He is righteous, who shall render to every man according to his works, Matthew 16, 27. He is strong in endurance, who being most powerful for our salvation, bore even with ungodly persecutors. He is long-suffering, who did not immediately after his resurrection hurry away to punishment even those that persecuted him, but bore with them that they might at length turn from that ungodliness to salvation. And still he bears with them, reserving the last penalty for the last judgment, and up to this present time inviting sinners to repentance, not bringing in anger every day. Perhaps bringing in anger is a more significant expression than being angry, and so we find it in the Greek copies, that the anger whereby he punishes should not be in him, but in the mind of those ministers who obey the commandments of truth, through whom Orders are given even to the lower ministries, who are called angels of wrath, to punish sin, whom even now the punishment of men delights not for justice's sake, in which they have no pleasure, but for malice's sake. God then does not bring in anger every day, that is, he does not collect his ministers for vengeance every day. For now the patience of God invites to repentance, but in the last time, when men through their hardness and impenitent hearts shall have treasured up for themselves anger in the day of anger and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, Romans 2, five, then he will brandish his sword. Unless ye be converted, he says, he will brandish his sword, verse 12. The Lord man himself may be taken to be God's double-edged sword, that is, his spear, which at his first coming he will not brandish, but hides, as it were, in the sheath of humiliation. But he will brandish it when, at the second coming, to judge the quick and dead in the manifest splendor of his glory. He shall flash light on his righteous ones and terror on the ungodly. Or in other copies, instead of, he shall brandish his sword, it has been written, he shall make bright his spear. But by which word I think the last coming of the Lord's glory most appropriately signified, seeing that he is understood of his person, which another son has, deliver, O Lord, my soul from the ungodly, your spear from the enemies of your hand. He has bent his bow and made it ready. The tenses of the words must not be altogether overlooked how he has spoken of the sword in the future. He will brandish of the bow in the past he has bent, and these words of the past tense follow after. <clears throat> and in it he has prepared the instruments of death. He has wrought his arrows for the burning. Verse 13. That bow, then I would readily take to be the Holy Scripture, in which by the strength of, new, of the New Testament, as by a sort of string, the hardness of the old has been bent and subdued. From thence the apostles are sent forth like arrows, or divine preachings are shot which arrows he has wrought for the burning arrows, that is, whereby being stricken they might be inflamed with heavenly love. For by what other arrows are was she stricken, who says, Bring me into the house of wine, place me among perfumes, crowd me among honey, for I have, for I have been wounded with love. By what other arrows is he kindled, who, desirous of returning to God and coming back from wandering, asks for help against crafty tongues, and to whom it is said, What shall be given you, or what added to you against the crafty tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty, 
with devastating calls, that is, calls whereby, when you are stricken and set on fire, you may burn with so great love of the kingdom of heaven as to despise the tongues of all that resist you, and would recall you from your purpose, and to divide their persecutions, saying, Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For I am persuaded, he says, that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor other creatures shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thus, for the burning has he wrought his hours. For in the Greek copies it is found thus, he has wrought his hours for the burning. But most of the Latin copies have burning hours. But whether the hours themselves burn or make others burn, which of course they can't do unless they burn themselves, the sense is complete. But since he has said that the Lord has prepared not hours only, but instruments of death too in the bow, it may be asked, what are instruments of death? Are they peradventure heretics? For they too out of the same bow, that is, out of the same scriptures, light upon souls not to be inflamed with love, but destroyed with poison, which does not happen but after their deserts. Wherefore, even this dispensation is to be assigned to the divine providence, not that it makes men sinners, but that it orders them after they have sinned. For through sin reaching them with an ill purpose, they are forced to understand them ill, that this should be itself the punishment of sin, by whose death, nevertheless, the sons of the Catholic Church are, as it were, by certain thorns, so to say, arouse from slumber, then make progress toward the understanding of the Holy Scriptures. For there must be also heresies, that they which are approved, he says, may be made manifest among you. 1 Corinthians 11.19 That is among men, seeing they are manifest to God. Or has he happily ordained the same hours to be at once instruments of death for the destruction of unbelievers and what them burning, or for the burning, for the exercising of the faithful? For that is not false that the apostle says, To the one we are the saviour of life unto life, to the others the saviour of death unto death. And who is sufficient for these things? To Corinthians 2.16 It is no wonder then, if the same apostles be both instruments of death in those from whom they suffered persecution and fiery hours to inflame the hearts of believers. Now after this dispensation righteous judgment will come, of which the psalmist so speaks, as that we may understand that each man's punishment is wrought out of his own sin, and his iniquity turned into vengeance, that we may not suppose that that tranquillity and ineffable light of God brings forth from itself the means of punishing sin, but that it so orders sins that what have been delights to man in sinning should be instruments to the Lord of venging. Behold, he says, he has to avail with injustice. Now, what had he conceived that he should travail with injustice? He has conceived, he says, toil. Hence then comes that, in toil shall you eat your bread. Genesis 3.17 Hence to that, come and come unto me, all you that toil and are heavy laden, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. For toil will never cease except when love that which cannot be taken away against his will. For when those things are loved which we can lose against our will, we must needs toil for them most miserably, and to obtain them amid the straightnesses of earthly cares, while each desires to snatch them 
for himself and to be beforehand with another or to wrest it from him must scheme in justice. Duly then and quite in order has he travailed with injustice, who has conceived toil. Now he brings forth what, save that with which he has travailed, although he has not travailed with that which he conceived, for that is not born, which is not conceived. But seed is conceived, that which is formed from the seed is born. Toil is then the seed of iniquity, but sin the conception of toil, that is, that first sin, to depart from God. Sirach 10.12 he then has to avail with injustice who has conceived toil, and he has brought forth iniquity. Iniquity is the same as injustice. He has brought forth then that with which it availed. What follows next? He has opened a ditch and dug it. Verse 15. To open a ditch is in earthly matters, that is, as it were, in the earth, to prepare deceit, that another fall therein, from the unrighteous man wishes to deceive. Now this ditch is opened when consent is given to the evil suggestion of earthly lusts. But it is dark when after consent we press on to actual work of deceit. But how can it be that iniquity should rather hurt the righteous man against whom it proceeds than the unrighteous heart whence it proceeds? Accordingly, the stealer of money, for instance, while he desires to inflict painful harm upon another, is himself maimed by the wound of avarice. Now who, even out of his right mind, sees not how great is the difference between these men when one suffers the loss of money, the other of innocence, he will fall then into the pit which he has made, as it is said in another psalm, the Lord is known in executing judgment. The sinner is caught in the works of his own hands. His toil shall be burnt on his head, and his iniquity shall descend on his pate. Verse 16. For he had not no mind to escape sin, but was brought unto sin as a slave, so to say, as the Lord says, Whosoever sinth is a slave. John 8.34 his iniquity then will be upon him when he is subject to his iniquity, for he could not say to the Lord what the innocent and upright say, My glory and the lifter up of my head. He then will be in such wise below, as that his iniquity may be above and descend on him, for that it weighs him down and burdens him, then suffers him not to fly back to the rest of the saints. This occurs when in an ill-regulated man reason is a slave and lust has dominion.